you probably look at the Circle K across the street from school and see a great place to get a snack or a drink. But I see an inspiration for computer-generated art. Do you see it? How about now? Or now? So in this video, I'm gonna show you how to create computer art that resembles this, just using programming by itself. We're gonna be using one of my favorite programming platforms, something called P5JS, which lets you make interactive art using JavaScript. So we're gonna make a design that looks like this. It's gonna be pretty close to what you see behind me. And with one simple extra step, we're gonna turn it into a fiery animation that we can use. With that, let's get coding. It's time to get into our next programming activity, which is something that I am really excited about, and I've been having a lot of fun with myself over the last couple of months, and that is generative art. That is, how can we use a computer to generate art all on its own? To do this, we're gonna be using the website uh, p5js.org and it's an online editor that uses JavaScript to create art using a framework called p5js. So you can see the address here. I hope you will follow along on your own as you build your own version of what I'm going to show you how to build today. Now what are we going to build? Well you can see on the screen right here is a picture that I took when I was standing outside the Circle K across from school. As a way to introduce you to the idea of generative art, we're going to be trying to make something that looks a lot like that picture. So keep that in mind as we build. Let's go over to the P5JS editor and I'm going to copy this line and actually paste it up here so you can get an idea of what it is. Right now there is only one line in our code uh, two lines in our code inside the setup function and one creates a canvas that's what we're going to be using to display all of the art that we create and we're setting the background color of that canvas and so that's all this is going to do we can change the size get an idea of what that looks like when we change it so you can see the 400 is the width and the 200 is the height if we want to make it a nice square, we can just keep those to be the same. This background function sets the color. If I make the background zero, we get a black background. And if I make it 255, we get a white background. What happens if you want to do colors? If you want to do colors, you actually have to tell it the three channels R, G, and B. So if I do 255, zero, zero, I get a completely red background. So I swap it to 0, 255, 0, that means the green channel is fully up and the others are 0, we get fully green. And we can include different combinations of these to get a bunch of really nice colors. So you can see changing these numbers makes it so that we can change the color of the background. For now what we're going to do is we're going to leave the background just at 50. So it's not totally black, but it's dark. Now let's try drawing some shapes. We're going to go to the reference to get an idea of what we can actually draw using the functions that are built into P5JS. So if we scroll down, you can see a whole bunch of 2D shapes that this already knows how to make. You can draw a curve, you can draw an ellipse, a circle. These are pretty straightforward and you can click into each of these to get an idea of what they do. So there's a circle, there's an ellipse, there we go. So lots of options. This doesn't really, it looks a lot like a circle, but if we, uh, if we want to see what it does, we can take it and paste it into our drawing. And uh, we can see that this is going to be an ellipse that is centered at the point 56, 46, and it's going to have 55 for its horizontal dimension and 55 for its vertical dimension. So it is a circle. If we wanted to flatten it out a bit, we can instead say that the horizontal width is 15, the vertical width is 55, and that's going to make it nice and tall and skinny. But we don't want an ellipse. We can look at our picture and we can see we have a whole bunch of triangles. So let's actually make some triangles. So we'll scroll down, go to triangle, is define the XY coordinates of each corner of the triangle. 
uh, looking at the image that's just, uh, just below here, you might be saying that's a lot of triangles for us to be generating on our own. Of course, there's an easier way to do this, and that is using a for loop. So let's see if we can use a for loop to generate a whole bunch of triangles. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what I've done here. I have defined the points that I'm going to be using to determine the, the vertices of those triangles. There's a lot going on here, so let's bring it back to start with a single triangle, and then we'll do uh, just a row of triangles, and then we'll do a bunch of rows of those triangles to generate this shape. I'm also going to change one other little thing. I'm going to define a size for those triangles. There. This means that I'll be able to change the size a little bit better, and that's even going to make it easier to see each thing as we, as we develop it. I'm going to change the J to just be uh, counting from 0 to 1. And so we'll do I for a start. It's just going to go from 0 to 1. So we get a single triangle. What this is doing is this is going to create one point that is at uh, 0, 0, because i is starting at 0. Then we're going to go to uh, i plus 1, so i is 0, so it goes to 1. 1 times triangle height, so it's going to go 1 to the one to the right and put a point there. And then it's going to add 1 to j, and it's going to go back to the original point, and uh, that's going to define the three positions. One thing that is really important to understand about the axes on this canvas is that uh, it's not the standard xy that we have in math class. The x-coordinates go positive to the right, but the y-coordinates go positive down. So that's a single triangle. I can change this to be 10, and now it will do a row of those triangles. And so now it's just incrementing the i variable. It's multiplying it by the triangle height and it's creating all of those triangles uh, side by side. And if I change this to 10, it now does the entire first row. It increments j by 1, and then repeats the same exact code, but now because j has been increased by 1, it does it in the next row, and then the next row, and then the next row, and so on. So that fills the entire, the entire screen. I'm going to go back to a single triangle, though, because it's time to talk about some properties of drawing things on the canvas. All right, that looks great. So I've made a triangle that's a little bit farther away from the corner so you can really see what's happening. We have control over the stroke, that is, the shape that is actually being drawn, so the outline, meaning we can set the color that's going to be used for the stroke on the outside. We can also control the fill, that is the color that's being used to fill the inside of the shape. And we set those differently. You can see I'm using a yellow for the stroke, and I'm using a red for the fill. This is important because it gives you a lot of control over exactly how things appear on the canvas. For right now, to make it very clear where our triangles are, I'm going to keep the stroke the way you see it here as a yellow color, and I'm going to leave the fill as red, and then down the line we'll be able to change that a little bit as we develop our, our code to match the image. Now let's take a minute to look back at our circle K image, and you can actually see that as we're generating the, the shapes, there's actually a top triangle and there's a bottom triangle, and they're two separate triangles. So it would be good to not only draw the top triangle, but also draw the bottom triangle. So let's throw in that code. There we go. So I realized as I was looking at this that I actually can do this by using the previous points that I came up with. So I'm still using this point and this point. Those are the same, and I'm just adding on the far corner 
uh, the corner opposite the one where I started over here. So now I have two triangles. If I want, I can actually switch this up so I can tell the difference between those two triangles. So I could make this one, let's just copy that over, we'll make that zero, make this 255, and uh, we'll leave that the other color. And so now you can kind of see this one's yellow, this one's blue, so we know that those two triangles are being made a little bit differently. It's not super important, but we'll, we'll just leave the code in there. And I want you to see that every time I change the, the stroke and the fill, it's kind of like I'm changing the pen color that I'm using or the paint that I'm using. When you want to change the way something looks, you just have to change the stroke and the fill for that particular shape. And when you want to go to another shape, you just change it uh, every time. This for loop will draw the first triangle. It'll change the pen color to this one, draw the second triangle and then go back to the for loop and go back to the original the, the original color. If I return this now to the size that we were using before and make it so that it's actually incrementing i all the way from 0 to 10 and j from 0 to 10, it will generate every single triangle in the, the canvas. So let's, uh, let's do that. There we have it. So we've now filled our filled our canvas, which is pretty cool. If you look at the triangles in the image again, looking looking at the image that we're trying to imitate, you don't see the edges of the triangles themselves. So I'm actually going to turn off the stroke. I'm going to do that by calling the no stroke function. And in order to tell the difference between these two these two shapes, I'm going to change the fill of the bottom shape just a little bit. So now you can see that we have a bit of a, of a difference between the top and the bottom. But if you look at the image, the image has a whole bunch of different uh, variations of, of triangle depth. It's not just fully bright or fully dark, it has a variation. So now what it would be good to do is, let's make it so that it has a random variation of that color. The pattern that you'll see is I'm really keeping the green and the blue channels approximately the same and the only thing I'm changing is this this red. So maybe what I need to do every time I set the fill is let's change the red value to be a random number. And that's not too hard to do. So I'm using the random function built into p5.js to generate a random value and this will be from I can put in the extents, that could be from 0 to 255. And then I'm filling the inside of that triangle, like so. So now we get a real nice variation in there. It's, a, it's, it's starting to really look like a circle K image. Let's try and make this even a little closer now. If you look at the image, it's actually the, the width and the height, it's a lot more like a, a, an extended rectangle. So let's, let's actually define some variables that we can play with and then we're not constantly changing them throughout. Lots of things have just happened. What I have done is I have made a variable for my canvas width, a variable for my canvas height, and I am now using those here to determine the size of the canvas that I create. I've also moved the uh, the numbers that were here inside of the for loop outside so that I can play with them, play with the values and get them exactly the way I want it. The other thing that I'm doing now is I'm determining the triangle height based on uh, the number of rows that I want to be in my pattern and the number of columns. And I'm using the width of the canvas and the number of columns to determine what that triangle height has to be. If I want to double this and I want 10 rows and 40 columns, it automatically calculates the triangle height now. And that's really starting to look a lot like our, our image. So we're getting closer and closer and closer. And so to wrap things up for this first step, I'm going to take the same code for the red value and I'm gonna put it down here for the fill so that now throughout the entire thing, we're getting a really nice, beautiful variation in the, the color. If you take a look, it's pretty close to, uh, to the source image, so we're getting there. There is a very clear, in the center of the image, it is brighter, 
and towards the edges it is darker, but there's still this random variation. And let's see if we can get that variation. Uh, when we're doing the random color, really what we want to do is, as J is sort of increasing halfway, J is doing the rows, so for the first half of J increasing, we want uh, the numbers that uh, red value are being chosen between to be increasing. So it's almost as if we, we want to take this to be J. Full disclosure, I was not actually expecting this to be the hardest part, but in retrospect, I should have because uh, this, this shading part, if you look at the actual image, is really kind of the, the thing that makes this special. And what I did was I came up with this conditional statement that does what I said it should do, and that is change the set of numbers that it should choose for the red level as you move down toward the middle of the, 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 the rows, and then it should decrease with the same kind of pattern as it goes toward the bottom edge. So choosing from sort of dark reds at the top, the brightest reds in the middle, and then back down to the darks. And it's not that complicated, but this part did take some playing around with, and also more time than I was expecting to figure out some of the math to get this to work clearly. But I think it's pretty good. And I really like, if you compare to the actual image, it's, it's very similar. Before we get it to look exactly like, like the art, we can count the number of rows and see that I actually have more rows than I probably should for this. So I'm gonna decrease this. I'm gonna make this maybe 30 and 15. And we'll run the code. And now it's looking pretty close to the same pattern as what's on Circle K. And I'm gonna show you one other thing that we can do because I haven't talked at all about this draw function. Setup is a function that runs just once. Draw is a function that runs rapidly. It happens over and over and over again. So if I paste all of that code into the draw function, that is between this brace and that brace, and I run it, you actually see it run the same algorithm over and over and over again. So you get this really cool fiery effect which is even cooler than the original image that Circle K poster came up with. So I'm really excited about that. There are two other things I'm just gonna show you. We can actually take all of this code. As cool as that is, I wanna show you some other options that we have. So there's the static image. Right now the width is 500 and 250. I've also changed some of the other code so that if we change this, for example, to be 1600 by 900 and we keep the rows and columns the same it'll actually scale the entire thing so that it has the same pattern but it's just bigger if I save the canvas into a variable then what I can do at the very end of the setup function is I can save the canvas so I can save that variable. I'm going to name it circle K background, and I'm going to give it the P and G ending. And so when I run this, it actually saves that file, and I can now use that for whatever I want. As you can notice, now this is an image, and I can put that in the background of my zoom, and uh, it's just kind of a cool thing to have in the background. So that's that. So I hope uh, you've enjoyed this process of putting this together. And now you can make your own version of this art with your own variations, maybe changing some of the look, and have some fun on your own. Thanks for watching.